Good day, everybody. I was going to say morning, but it's, uh, it's actually an afternoon here, and who knows what time where you are. Um, so first, uh, let's forward the slide to the next one. First, I'm going to preface it with what we actually wrote and why you, of course, care a little bit. So why mobile patterns? Well, first of all, the presentation about it because we wrote a book about it. So yes, we want you to buy the book. But mostly I wanted to uh, give you the background that we're going to be talking about the patterns as their blood mobile design with this, with our mobile interfaces book as the basis for the discussion today. Uh, and, I, and I'll also admit that since you can see two names on the cover, I wrote the book with a friend who's now working in Australia, so he's in a different time zone, so he's uh, not joining us today. So I'm going to keep saying I did stuff, but really it was a collaborative effort. So not to say anything bad to Eric, we love him. The book really, though, came from our, our long history, sometimes decades long history, of collecting processes, design artifacts, and generally documenting design. So when O'Reilly came to us and let us write a book, we were really excited to make it larger and more formal. And so, you know, we could uh, be part of the history of architecture and computer science classics or even things like the uh, heavily referenced Apple and Microsoft Human Factors Guidelines. So you can see a few bullets here. We wanted to make something that wasn't just about any particular platform or any particular interface. It's not a touch thing. It's not an iOS thing. It's even a smartphone platform stuff. And then I'm going to talk a whole bunch about the structure organization and the fact that it's all based on psychology and science, and there's reasons behind it. I assume this confused our publisher a little bit, as it's more about design and psychology than technology and implementation. But you know, since a bunch of you are listening in today, I assume we've uh, made the right choice. How many need any more? And um, I'll go into it in more detail. But we did try, you know, have to uh, rope it back a little. So there are a few implementation details that got added at the last minute make sure everybody understood how you can apply this to day-to-day -day life, which is actually what we're going to, I'm going to try to talk about mostly today, how you will uh, apply this to your work. Uh, I can't get my phone. Sorry. There you go. I couldn't get to my notes. You can't see them, but I couldn't. Um, how you, why you care about this is how you're going to apply it to your day-to-day -day work. So we're going to assume a few things here. For example, that you um, have a chance to d design in a formalized manner. You know, you have a little bit of time. I know, in fact, a lot of times when you're doing design, you're doing it off the cuff or somebody needs an immediate decision from you. But even then, once you get into the gist of how to apply design heuristics and so forth correctly, then you can uh, you can implement quickly. But we're going to make some assumptions here about about doing long involved processes, and uh, so I know that's not always true, but it's best for our discussion points. But overall, when I say how you're going to use them. This isn't an instructional guide about how to read my book or anything. It's how to use the principles of patterns to make your own work better and faster. The way I think of it, patterns are applied heuristics. You, may, you don't just need to pick patterns to use, but you need to be able to understand them enough that you can bend them to your will. As you get into looking at, say, some of the example patterns, if you go to the, uh, the wiki you've got or if you've downloaded the, uh, the book already and re started reading it, there are subsets and sections and descriptions of variations. And you can't, therefore, always just pick a pattern and apply it. You need to know why it does what it does. If you know all this information, you're not constrained by patterns. It's not like applying the brand style guide and you feel all sad that nothing can be, and everything on the page has to be purple. There, you can use them for your needs. You can customize them. You can codify them for your product set, so it's absorbing and reusing everybody else's ideas. The way I think about it, at least, patterns can be applied at various levels. When you start work for a particular product project, and this is assuming a few level below uh, architecture and so forth, which uh, which is another interesting discussion we could have sometime. But we'll assume that you have a basic basic idea of what the system flow is. And when you start the work, you have the grid, not just in the sense of columns and margins, but you start setting standards for type sizes, 
the, you know what viewport sizes or physical sizes of the uh, device it's going to go on to, and of course a whole set of devices. Um, preferably by class. If you're only doing one device, great, that makes things a lot easier, but in general you probably can't get away with that or you can't get away with it for more than a couple releases before people clamor for other platforms to have it or a web version. At the wrapper level, and you notice I have four tiers of information here. The grid is your basic one. The wrapper is a name that I, and I, I've heard a lot of people use it, so I use it as though it's generic. It's the, um, the masthead, the footer, the scroll bar positioning, and stuff like that. It's basically exactly what it says the next tier down from grid. Common elements that are on every page, and therefore you design a little bit like their super templates. They're, they're above the top, and everything has to abide by them. So the wrapper level, you decide to start deciding things like access methods to meet the architecture. You use tabs, if you use tabs, what kind, where's the title, and how does it relate to navigation elements like tabs. Templates apply more of these. There's a handful of templates, if you're using the same terminology I am, to build an entire product. There's a handful of templates that you apply to all your pages. They fall straight from the grid wrapper stuff, so they're consistent but you have to design them individually to make sure they all fit. And they start using these widgets, well, these interface widgets that you absorb from design patterns by looking them up in a codified way where they're listed somewhere, like our book, or by copying from an existing product, or developing something your own that you found works well because that's what you need. I think there's a lot to be said for knowing why things work. I already said it a couple of times, and let me talk about it for a minute, a, bit, a little bit here about why I think it's important. So when I said up front, this is a, we didn't write patterns about touch screens or iOS or even smartphones in general. We wrote them about mobile devices in general. We think that knowing where you have to know history to know why things are and to know where they're coming from. We like to lose history now, to, to pick on the, the biggest people, um, especially since there's been an, a couple articles in the last few days talking about uh, how there's now admissions even from John Ives, how things aren't, don't come from the way they do. Apple didn't invent almost anything. Not to be anti-fanboy, they do great, great products. She didn't know why they came, where they came from, what caused these interfaces to be developed, what ideas were abandoned along the way, and why. And with a graph of history, you get a chance to predict the future. When we get to anti patterns in a little couple pages here, this will make more sense. Basically, if a product failed for good reason, like good cognitive psychology reasons, meaning people's brains don't work like that, then you need to know not to try it again without a sensible change. Some things fail for business reasons, or competitive reasons, or legal reasons, or it was, couldn't work technologically because it was too early in the marketplace or something. But that's not, but there are, so there are different types of failure and you know why things exist. A lot of things that are popular today, best practice, for example, today, are kind of arbitrary or, again, succeeded for business reasons and maybe aren't the best actual interface. Here at the bottom I've given you three examples of things that I have. I have a giant pile of uh, devices and I'm constantly collecting more and more of them. But these are three that I actually have that I either worked on or otherwise I have functioning today. Um, I actually have a column three that actually works. I don't carry it around every day, but it's great to go back to something that old and look at the interfaces. Um, it's got all kinds of ridiculously modern interactions. It was, well, let's say a high, let's call it a higher resolution screen and a wireless connection and a browser. You could use this thing as an actual mid or some sort of device like that today. It's quite a reasonable snappy device of a reasonable size that isn't strange in almost any way. It's clearly the antecedent to the smartphone. Just, you know, isn't. There's a few, and there's a few little technology things the writing area is interesting. Um, so good, mostly. That middle one, believe it or not, is a camera phone. If you're wondering what you're looking at, and you can giggle out loud about it if you want. It's a camera that plugged into a small number, I think two, only two or three hands, normal flip phone back when there was no such thing really as a smartphone. And that, there were a few camera phones embedded in Japan at the time, but this was I plus or minus the first camera phone in North America. 
you, yeah, like I said, you're allowed to giggle at it, so why will it be at the sale? But why did it fail is the question. And that, and if you think, well, that's irrelevant, I mean, come on, camera, phone, we can bet anything. Think about the business model of somebody like Square. If you do a little more research, you'll find out that they changed their um, hardware quite a bit early on. You've never even seen their original hardware as far as I know. I don't think it's, in, it's visible out in the general world. And this is the kind of thing that, the kind of the reason for that. They had to put quite a bit of thought into the fact that they were going to build an add-on. They weren't going to be integrated into any one device if they're going to be successful. But add-ons like this don't work well. Why? Why not? How can I implement? How can I make an add-on, a bolt-on to a device that works well? The far right one is something I actually worked on, and it was so beloved. After I finished it, my wife carried it for years until she lost it. First MP3 phone in. I thought it was very early, it was like only North America, but when I researched it lately, supposedly in the whole world. Um, it had almost no memory, terrible way to get music on it, but it works. And it's actually, in retrospect, not radically different from, say, using iTunes as a management system, or the interface isn't very different. So then that failed. Why? Um, a lot of business reasons too expensive, not enough of them could be made, so by the time they got enough in the marketplace, there were competitors to it. So things you need to know when you have to know your history to know why certain interfaces failed, and there's a lot of history out there. Luckily, most of our stuff has happened during the Internet age, so we can go look up a lot of this. So a couple of slides about what things patterns are not. Patterns are not scrapbooks. This might look like I'm making on people like Mary Sheep, I can't pronounce her name, Sheebly, from mobilepatterns.com. Yes, this item is a few from there. But um, before that existed, I had the same basic slide in a couple other presentations I was doing earlier. Uh, and I've had much of the same opinion for about 30 years. From the time I started acting like a designer, I collected interesting things. This goes back to print era, like when I was in junior high. Uh, or full of magazine clippings, which I eventually sorted into categories and put little file folders and stuff. But it took forever when you wanted to get something to find the right image. And more to the point, collection wasn't enough. Um, I didn't know why, I only had in my brain why I liked certain things. But I didn't actually know anything else about what was good about them. I had to curate the thing. So selective keeping it organized a little bit better, but you need to be able to analyze and do so in a, in a coherent, repeatable manner. So what's good about patterns, at least the way that I can see them, is patterns are universal. This, by the way, is, I, I forgot I have the slide in here. This is around half of the actual devices that I own. Uh, none of these are barred or anything like that. This is all my stuff, and many of these power on even the ridiculously old ones. Like I said, my Palm 3, which is in the bottom row near the left. And another question a lot of people ask me when they see this kind of thing or when, they're talk, when I talk about the fact that you use no devices is what do I carry all the time? And it doesn't actually matter because I've carried seven different devices and four different OSs as my full-time phone for the last, in the last three years for that good reason, that you need to switch around a lot to know things. Keep your hand on the market and don't just stick to your favorite device. Your design is in about one device or browser, and even if your design is, you're missing out on other good ideas and will miss the historical context you came from. Remember, we just talked about that. So this is, an, these are actually some screens out of the book itself, those little yellow things up top. And as an example, of, these are all from the tabs one. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to preface that thing. In the tabs pattern, there's at least four different kinds shown. You think tabs are just tabs, but here's four different versions of it. And as an example, I have four different screenshots down below. Again, these are all things I actually have. So if the uh, screenshots look a little chunky, 
and uh, grainy. That's because it's very difficult to get screenshots in some old devices, so uh, some of them I had to photograph. But you see, this doesn't even cut take. This has um, no nothing that you'd probably consider a smartphone. The uh, S60 system is, is a smartphone and still the highest, one of the largest ones in the world, but they've decided to kill it, so it's not counted anymore. Mostly just everyday dumb phones, random, random devices lying around with terrifically interesting ideas. I didn't even have to pull up an iOS or Android device in this one to give you all these different interfaces. And some of these, I think that far right one, for example, with little little indicators is a brilliantly good idea that I haven't seen much of anywhere else. So if you're highly space constrained, what a neat way to show that at least you're in the area. It's not as good as showing um, that not the contents of the other tabs, or for example, but versus the one immediately to the left of this, where you go, well, I'm on messaging, but what's the next and previous, you know, how many items are there? Maybe I don't even notice the arrows. I see a lot of this where people are reinventing the wheel with, because they're not finding good ideas from other places. As I said a little bit earlier about um, the, the fact that I've carried a lot of devices and I have a lot of them, you also need to use your device and try to use it the way that your users use it. So if you don't believe in your product set, well, pretend you believe in your product and try to figure out how your how your uh, users that you targeted for your experience are likely to employ the device. If you're building a video sharing service, start taking videos of the cats or the kids or whatever it is you do and sharing them to the various services and see what people do. My example here is that I worked on a, uh, I work on several actually browser things, but I had a relatively recent project doing browser design, porting a, uh, an old G2ME browser to Android. So I've taken it on myself to start experiencing every browser there's an Android. There's actually 17 browsers now. I actually rented a room because you only fit 16 per screen. So I only have 16 browsers visible up there. In general, remember everything. Because again, here I found some great stuff. Don't just use the most, the most popular thing in the App Store or the best case or the highest rated one. And at the very least, use the most popular thing in the App Store, the highest rated one in other countries. The uh, third row, the third from the left, UC Browser, is a, China, luckily, an English language version now of it, the, by far the most popular version in China. It was important enough when I found out that it was a big deal that I went ahead and got the Chinese language version of it for um, the first year that it was available. Uh, which was a little bit of harrowing, not because the controls were difficult, it's actually a pretty easy to use browser, uh, even when you can't read Chinese, but because it said it was a Chinese language browser, so any site that was multilingual would give me the Chinese character set instead of uh, the English one, and I couldn't use the menus enough to switch it back, so it wasn't totally useful. But I still got a lot of great ideas about, say, menu structures. They do some different stuff, not in any other, any other browser, and that gave me a lot of great ideas. Similarly, moving along, patterns are generalized. We're a little bit getting back into the um, concept of not using screenshots only when you're talking about patterns. Um, on the right here, we have a screenshot of a drag out menu. And it took at least, the, at least two here to even kind of explain what it's doing, that you drag a point and things appear, and then when you're done, they go all the way there, and there's menus. I think it's terribly confusing even as two screenshots. So I uh, ended up using illustrations, I actually, and that's one where I can, I can say that nicely. I actually drew all of the illustrations, so that's I. Eric had nothing to do with that part. Um, he wrote other things. And uh, there's all kinds of stuff about why illustrations are good. You can ask more if you want it about that. Um, examples are useful. Experiencing real interfaces is really useful. Like on the previous slide, you should download stuff and try everything, borrow friends' phones when they bring them by, go to stores and try out new phones. But you need to know what the fundamental truths are of these things, and there's all and a pattern listing, whether you're reading a book like mine or you're writing your own patterns for everybody to implement consistently across your enterprise, you have to explain exactly what the important part is and show exactly the important part and not everything else. Uh, I think another example on this one actually is that the, on the right, those little illustrations, it's hard to tell what you're supposed to even be looking at. 
for example, on the right one, the far right one, there's that trash can icon. They very cleverly designed the trash can icon to be obscured by your hand and finger when you're actually using the interface. So it's, it's not really noticeable at all when you're actually using it. Putting a finger on there, on the other hand, would make it very hard to understand what's going on at the interface. There's no real way to balance, turn a screenshot into the way an actual experience would work. Going backwards, essentially, patterns should be organized. Hmm. If that's appearing the way it is to you, then that's a, that picture on the right shouldn't have a giant black background. I'm sorry, it's just a screenshot of the book. but. Uh, We'll just move on for about that. On the left side, though, instead, is a table of contents. Patterns are grouped with similar ones, and not necessarily competing ideas, but conceptually, architecturally similar solutions, uh, like drill down functions. So the tabs I showed you earlier are adjacent to, I believe, things like links and tearaway panels and flip overs and other ways to get to more information that's parallel to the current information. You have to build, or I think at least you should, build a taxonomy of patterns to help understand what they do, why they do that, and what other options are available. Um, ah, the, the thing that's not visible, and if you're not uh, seeing that panel, like I said, if, if you're seeing police the way I am, little white words on top of the black background are blue words that uh, link to other patterns. So anytime there's something where you could find more information, I cross-link them all. I think this is critical even for like libraries and repositories inside your, uh, your company or the ones you keep yourself. Instead of explaining everything, you explain why, what's interesting in context, go see this for more details about the way that you style links. You don't have to explain it in every single pattern. I should also mention that this was not a particularly easy thing to do. So we didn't just come up with the whole concept for this out of whole cloth and go, ah, here's our patterns that we're going to use, and let's start writing them up and defining them. We agonized on this for a long time, and by agonized I mean went back and forth and, um, and changed our minds and wrote entire patterns that ended up not being published at all, and they're off, I think they're up on the wiki so you can see the ones, but there you go. Um, this, by the way, uh, to the left is there, to the right is me, so I'm still anonymous, you can't see my face. Uh, and you can tell about a year, yes, over a year ago, so Christmas, the uh, Halloween decorations just got up. We sat in front of the big TV and put the spreadsheet up and stroked our beards and thought about it a lot as we moved things around. This is, this, at this point, we'd actually already written about, or at least drafted uh, about half of the patterns, and we were still finding things that didn't quite interrelate correctly. Um, I can see how Alexander, with his big uh, architecture pattern books, spent his entire career is still working on um, his concept of morphology and spaces and, and anyway, basically wrote, has been writing a pattern book for 25 years. I only, we only settled on the number that we got and the organization we got because there was a deadline and we had to get this out so that you guys could use it as well as we get paid a little bit. I could have easily spent 10 more years doing this. And yes, the cat helped a lot while doing all this work. So just like above, I mentioned that uh, patterns are generalized so that they're drawn, illustrated so they're easy to understand. Patterns are also explained. I don't, um, uh, again, same kind of argument about simply taking um, screenshot libraries only gets you so far. Even illustrations, even annotated illustrations or illustrations with captions only gets you so far. You have to actually use words to explain what things are. You can think of this as, um, as like a generalized functional requirement or story or whatever you're used to. And if you're sad about building those, well, they're required. Documentation makes sure things are understood in an absolutely consistent manner and can be referred to later on. We actually built, like we built the taxonomy, we built an organizational structure for each pattern. So everyone can be more or less compared straight across. I mean, they all have the same sections, but sometimes one section is much bigger or smaller than another one. 
Uh, and I'll, I'm gonna, I'll try not to bore you here by reading everything out, but um, as I go over each of the sections, you understand one of why we did them. They're explaining the purpose of the book, but in kind of a this is how you read my book way, much more than a why we did them that way. Titles or a pain. All too often there's pet names, so we had to avoid those or OS specific names or anything to be confused. Um, Enunciator row is the thing at the top of your screen, as we call it, that has your power level and, and so forth. Uh, a lot of people call it a notification bar, but notifications aren't always in the enunciator row, so, and we talk about them separately because they're so different, so we couldn't use that. Enunciators are old school and generic, and a light that blinks to tell you the boiler is about to explode is an enunciator. So we use that because it's generalized, generic, and it doesn't mean anything else in mobile. The next section is the problem statement. Um, this is one of those terms that I use a lot in business that causes uh, people to have a lot of heartache. I like problem statements. Both a lot of people in marketing and product development who want them to be, I don't know, maybe opportunity statements. But I think really that as designers we're solving problems. It's not a bad thing. Problems exist in the world to be solved. But that's what they are. Um, and then there's the solution section. The solution basically explains the um, the, at the, the, the shortest possible way what the pattern actually does without actually referring to a picture. It just describes it. Oh, I should also mention if you look at the bottom of the problem statement on the left side of the page, this is an example of where I put in some of those implementation details. Uh, this did happen after we got feedback from our, uh, our mostly highly renowned edit editorial staff, people you've heard of who said, well, wait, you can't use this because it's only POS level. To me, I think these patterns should be maybe even used by people designing device OSs, and there's a lot more of those people than you'd think. It's not just uh, HTC and VTE and Apple and Samsung and Motorola. There's a lot of devices being built in the world, and a lot of them are built poorly. So, so we put that in there. If you can't influence it as an everyday web designer, it says that. and you can move on and not read the rest of it you want. The next section is probably the most important one, and I'm sorry again, the picture is on my screen at least looks very strange, so hopefully you aren't seeing giant black backgrounds. Maybe we can clean this up somehow um, for the recorded version. But anyway, the variation section is the next one. I think it's one of the most important, and it was one of those that caused a lot of problems with that whole taxonomy and will cause you problems to understand it or to build your own library of uh, patterns and concepts if you're doing this. When do you split a, an idea or merge one? We ended up doing that a lot. And a month before we handed over the, the, the manuscript for printing, we were, had merged a couple patterns and split a couple other ones out. Sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it just straight up is not. Interrelationships between patterns are not always that clear. Sometimes the, the variations aren't even also A, B, and C, but are ranges of stuff. Um, you can, this gets too complex, so I'm not gonna bother over explaining it, but there are, there's, a, a, there's no single way to do it right, and there's not even three ways to do it right. There's a range of ways that you can do it, and maybe it intersects another range of ways that they can be represented, and so you pick somewhere on the continuum avoid a few of the bad problems and basically do the solve as you wish. Interaction details and uh, presentation details are the two tactical sections that we have tell you how to actually do it. Basically, you can copy these into your requirement document if you want to. Sometimes I actually have stuff that I myself have been placing in requirements documents or otherwise writing on whiteboards or emailing to developers for years. Um, things like the timing for a hover state, how, uh, how pop-up things work, the size targets for touch, touch experiences, or um, the natural language date organization is one I copy a lot for myself when it says yesterday or Tuesday at 2 in the afternoon versus giving a long date time code. We've codified as many of those as possible in a generic way. And the last one on the far right is anti-patterns with even a big reddish-orange X over the top of the thing to remind you that even though you're looking at a picture, it's a bad picture and don't do that. Ideally, 
officially, and I've been told this, and that I'm terrible and wrong person for calling this section an anti-pattern. Ideally, an anti-pattern is a complete pattern that you don't do for very specific reasons. But that's not really super useful in day-to-day -day work, and the name's catchy, so I just used it, used the name here. Basically, it's anti-variations is much closer to what it is. Or otherwise, anti-anything, anti-implementation um, details of interaction or presentation that you should avoid doing because there are specific problems. When you build custom implementations, you're going to find even more of them, not just as you do user testing, but things like your data stream does not work this way or your customers do not think about the product in this way. So even though something is a best practice and a confirmed research best practice, not just a common practice, it can't work for you guys. And you need to not just say don't do it, but also say again, you can probably start guessing, why you don't do it. Because not only do people need to know why, but people need to know um, why for the future. Maybe something changes. Maybe there's a different line of business. Which reminds me, of, or sorry, segues nicely into one of the things I've been starting to say a lot the last couple of slides. Patterns are best practices, but not always common practice. A common one not shown here is, which I'm sure some of you have fallen into, is the web form that has submit and cancel at the bottom, or sorry, submit and clear at the bottom. Submit is pretty generic, so we shouldn't do that. That's not a huge, huge, terrible thing. But clear, clear is an old form thing, an old, um, an old terminal style system. I've actually worked summer jobs where I did data entry. And there was, you know, submit and present next form, submit and exit, or clear forms to start over. If you're just sending a single contact form as a consumer, you don't ever want clear. All it does is delete the, delete the form. That's a common practice. That's what could be instead be called a worst practice. Don't do that. Here I've got as examples the problem of uh, generic icons. We started putting little thumbnail avatars for every single person in your address book, but if they're not linked up right, and a lot of them aren't, because not every one of your friends shares their Facebook account with you, you end up with a bunch of little silhouetted heads, and that's not very helpful. Now you're going, well, I picked the third silhouetted head under the S's. No, you're going to start looking at words. You might as well just start with the words. Fashion and interior design work differently, but user experience is evidence-based. Just because the topic doesn't make it right. And if there's clear research, evidence from research generally it's wrong, then I would I say so in my book, and you should say so whenever you're deciding why you do certain things. Obviously, a key, a key attribute of patterns is not that they're misunderstood. I've switched gears here now. Patterns are misunderstood means they're misapplied. In these five ways that I say, they're design solutions are reactionary and solve for point problems instead of considering entire systems. Even when larger solutions are found, they're single view or only for one screen, one device, or one platform. The first satisfactory solution is accepted and rapidly becomes entrenched. There should always be incentives to find the best possible solution, even if you have to iterate, for example. Don't forget and leave it there. There's likewise no incentive to find unique, interesting, or differentiable solutions. The rote solution or the published pattern is used without modification, which is another reason. We're back to the part where I don't like to give examples. I want to make you implement the example. And patterns that do consider solutions generally lead to excessively high-level design with no reasoning or an incomprehensible one that visual designers and developers will understand what part is important, so will modify it to meet their needs and miss the point of the solution. You need to have a detailed enough solution that people can understand and follow it. I tend to call all of this the heuristic solution. It's not bad, per se. It checks all the boxes, um, but it's not inspired, never truly satisfactory. And I mean literal satisfaction. It might pass this customer satisfaction measurements, but they worked a bunch of places where those were key to us getting our bonuses. <clears throat> and
and it even shows improvement. But it levels off and you never get to that top tier of um, truly satisfied, extraordinary, award-winning type designs and customers with total loyalty no matter what you do. Uh, the example down below is an okay site, works okay, and each decision, every screen is more than acceptable, but only great in isolate, but not great, it's only, and they're only in isolation. As a system, it falls down, it's not clear what the relationship between, say, the labels and the tabs and the banners are. I'm sure you can think of thousands of other examples. And I was, that's my plan. The, uh, the avoiding the nearest success solution is my uh, talk, for, talk for next month. So if you want to know more about that, you don't have to ask any questions today. You can either uh, look at some of my old presentations or just show up next month. And in general, um, you can learn more about this by, of course, buying the book. It's available on uh, O'Reilly stores. You can buy Kindle books a day, and I think in a week or two in print. We have essentially all the information on, uh, from the book, though it's a little out of date, so we'll be updating it up on the uh, wiki at the address you see, um, as well as a lot of other design resources that have been updated since the book comes out, and I, and I update at least once a week. I add new tools and so forth. And you can see a few more things. Uh, yet another um, presentation a month in January. So now, I'm going to go look at your questions and see what, uh, oh, as soon as I can click the link, what is worth talking about now? So give me a moment to uh, scroll and see what's the most interesting stuff. I think one of, the, one of the questions here was about display and usability differences between browsers all forking at each from the same code base. Um, I hope I answered correctly, but I had a question about this on a, on a related but not this uh, talk topic earlier today. And um, I tend to say that you need to design for at least the design needs to be for each and every platform and every, um, every class of device. And what class means is a little bit, um, can be quite fuzzy. You need, it's kind of like taking personas for your devices, for your, sorry, for your uh, product set, that you need to think about whether screen size or the ability to have a voice carrier or which operator you're on or which country you're in or you know, there's a camera, you need to figure out what parts of that matter. Sometimes, of course, it matters what the browser is. If you're talking web browser, does it have, um, if you're dealing with some of the older slower devices, they don't have, say, JavaScript actions that, have, that function after the page is loaded. The reason I say that is that you're going to end up with a lot of developers, and not all of them, there's different opinions, of course, which is quite a question, but you're going to end up with a lot of developers who want to go with maximum efficiency and reuse the same code everywhere. And I tend, in principle, to agree with this, but in practice, you often need special um, server-side code, not just serving up the right stuff for the presentation layer, but special server code to make things go the right way. If you have a design that, that addresses every individual interface, then at least you have a reason to argue it. So to a certain degree, I just answer the typical UX guy depends. But the other thing you can do with that is be a little pragmatic and decide where will it fall down. You have a reason to decide to argue that things will work well in this way, but it will collapse there, and therefore you can figure out whether the business wants to spend that much money to do a custom version. Um, I sadly for this kind of answer, I don't think that the browsers are going to settle down anytime soon. Um, if anything, they're going to get more complicated for, you know, in, in spurts. So it's not like you're going to say WebKit has won the, won the war and we'll all design for that. And then everybody else can kind of tag along. You're going to have to keep monitoring it. And again, you're also going to have to keep monitoring for your business. You can't use the latest global report 
or even a regional report about what people are using. You need to know what your customers use. Even with BlackBerry descending massively in, in uh, total installed base, they are still the dominant force in certain industries. So if your industry has 80% BlackBerry users, you're going to have to use that. So another one, yeah, and sometimes it's nice when you're uh, in a room with people with questions. I can go, I'm not quoting the question, or I can answer it briefly and find out if I got it right. But another question about whether it's important to use patterns that work for any mobile or anything in the future, which is something I just talked about uh, separately again this morning. So you can like, you look at my blog and you'll find that. But I'm, I'm pretty big on, I started actually say, started. I hope I started a catchphrase this morning, which is the design for every screen. I think a lot of patterns, despite having just what I'm selling here about is a uh, mobile pattern book, I think a lot of patterns are really device agnostic and they have applications to each and every um, other device. So there, there are differences for 10-foot UI and kiosks and handheld mobiles and desktop web, say. But at their heart, they're the same because people are, are still generally human beings and they all work in probably the same way. So you get to context, um, context of use instead. Not always the crazy context that some people say I'm wrong to pursue where, well, you need to think of the fact you can use your device anywhere, like work with glare or whatever it's on a bus. But the thing where it can work where you might use an interface anywhere in the sense that you can now uh, they have mobile devices, say, that plug into HDMI ports so it can go on your TV. So you, uh, you might have to build an interface that works not just on an um, uh, old mobile phone and a modern mobile phone and the cool new Slate one, but also works on that same, very same device when it's plugged into a TV. And you don't want a jarring change when you switch to the 10-foot interface because it's on the TV, especially because you're probably using the handset to control what's on the TV. So what does that mean for interface, for interface space and interaction design? It means there needs to be a relationship between the two, and not just a stylistic one, but often an interaction one. So you're going to end up using similar patterns or trying to use patterns that are that apply to both of them at the same time. Um, let me think about this one. <clears throat> the question about a very, rather general one about what I think of native versus web, which I assume is app or web. I think I'd answer that and kind of the, start the answer in kind of the same way I did the last one, which is that I like to design for every screen. Um, at the start, um, literally without um, you know, screen agnostic, uh, interface agnostic. What is the end user going to use to do with this thing? And then at some point that evolves, you use the, inter the information to evolve it to figure out which interface they're actually going to use mostly. And you use that um, pragmatically to figure out what you can afford to do first because you can't do everything at first. And so let's say you do um, an app first for some perfectly good reason, like you need access to the camera. So a lot of those are, I think a lot of these are, questions are solved. Is it web or is it an app? By simple things like access. If you need precision location control, there are ways to get it in the web, but not 100%, not completely reliably yet. Camera, even harder. I mean, we're getting there, but today, there's often a solid split. Regardless, well, let's say you've decided that you got a, uh, you have to do a, um, application. And that works fine. You can get to the market share enough or you're dedicated to doing two or three applications so you've got almost everybody who's going to come to your site. Well, even if you, that's it, and you don't have to worry about the web for those other people who might come to your site, and those all are important to me, what about people who don't have the app installed yet and search for you? They're going to probably need a website to land on. And there's even other interfaces. Does the email look like it's part of your company? 
if they get a password reset or as part of the confirmation or the payment scheme. Um, I've seen, I've actually worked with people who, for example, did a poor job at loading the thing in the app store, so it didn't look like the same application. The logo and the screenshot didn't look like what they were selling on the rest of their website, so you couldn't, and the name was weird, so you couldn't even find it. You need to think about everything at once. When it comes to the strict quick answer, I kind of did already. It's that one where are you fine leaving 20% or 80% of your customers' business on the table and only going for the top device or worse, only the device that your boss carries when you do the research and find out that that 20% of your customers use uh, iOS but 37% use Android and the rest are on various things including feature phones. And you find out that, well, a lot of those because this does work in some markets, a lot of those people are actually using the web or using SMS or email from their phone. Do you want to just leave those behind to have the cool app? Or should you maybe do something more pragmatic and like get, start with an SMS marketing campaign and then build a mobile website to get everybody on it? And then see how people use it and, use, and build the custom app that does the neat stuff like capturing um, um, barcodes or whatever is needed. To, uh, to appeal to those, those people willing to install the app to get you the stickiness for those loyal customers. Okay, interesting question that sadly got cut off. Apparently there's a text limit, so be careful how long you type but I'll try with what, what actually made it through to me. Attacking basically don't, um, big companies force to use the design patterns, um, but this, thus they become what do you call good patterns or best practices. Um, I assume we mean things like Apple because they have their human interface guidelines because, IO, because every designer carries an iOS device that, that equals best practice. Um, and again, I'll, just, I'll assume it's the manufacturers when you say big companies, but it might have meant something else. If so, please type another email and I'll do it. And I'll, sorry, type another question and I'll try to respond to that in the few minutes we have left. Um, I still say, and that's why I have the slide in there about it, that best, uh, common practice is not always best practice. There are a lot of common practices that are um, even shiny and beloved that are not a good idea. The one I have up here is extremely common with the um, lots of little icons that mean nothing, whether it's for a list of, of people or for anything else. Um, even, uh, do you want to pick on iOS again because Apple got mentioned, the, um, the new revolutionary grid of icons which is in no way revolutionary or interesting, is also possibly not good. Widgets seem to be taking over the world in a lot of places. Um, if, you, if I had to pick a, one of the more revolutionary, interesting platforms, it would definitely be Windows Phone because they're switching, um, which I don't actually carry and I don't work for Microsoft, never have. But just looking at it, they're, they're switching out a lot. They're not just um, evolving it, but they're uh, revolutionarily changing it with every release now possibly in bad ways to developers, but it's not about little square icons, it's about little square widgets that show you information with zero clicks, and isn't that an interesting way to do things? So why are, is grid of pure icons a good practice? It's shiny and pretty in screenshots, and it gives you a neat way to show off your, um, your design skills in, in making up the coolest possible icon, such that, say, instamatic tweaks there, um, their gradients and makes it to a branding site. The, the most interesting rebrand of this week is Instamatic Tweak to Gradients, and that's what shows up on your iOS home screen. I'm not sure that's really serving the customer's interaction principles and needs the best way that it can. And so I'd love to see um, best practices um, uh, understood better by, develop, by developers of device OSs as well, or device OS overlays. Um, as another example, so HTC's Sense UI is not beloved by everybody, 
but it's been changing and improving, and not always just to get out of the way to get Google's interface there. There are good overlays and there are good customizations that happen for device manufacturers and operators above and beyond the OS. That and, and so there are plenty of people who can influence this stuff, and if they're going to keep influencing it for what's trendy or cool or with strikes their fancy, then I don't think we're going to be serving the customer as well. So, um, so I hope I answered that. Anyway, that seems to be about the only questions that, that covers the range of the questions available.